Greetings, Western Civ 2. So we're in the 1950s, the age of Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower, as you'll remember, was elected President of the United States in 1952. November of 52, remember our presidents are elected. The elections take place on the first Tuesday in November, according to the Constitution, unless that first Tuesday is the first of November and then they postpone it till the 8th of November. I don't know why, but that's how it is. Uh, so our presidents are elected in early November, but they don't take office until January the 20th of the following year. So he be took office in January 20th, 1953. He would remain president until January 20th, 1961. So most of the 1950s, Dwight Eisenhower was the president of the United States. Now, Eisenhower was a professional soldier. You'll remember that he had been the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. It was Eisenhower, who oversaw the D-Day landings at Normandy and the Western British and American and Canadian and French forces sweeping into Western Germany uh, and the defeat of Hitler. Now, this made Dwight Eisenhower probably the single greatest war hero of World War II in the United States. So, no great surprise that when both parties were looking for a candidate in 1953, they both tried to talk Dwight Eisenhower into being their candidate. Um, he did not have strong party identification either way, but what party identification he had was Republican. So I guess we would call him a very moderate Republican, but almost it was beyond party. Uh, he, he really did have a sort of idealistic uh, thing that politics shouldn't be a big partisan fight all the time. Um, now, this moderate, middle-of-the-road approach actually appealed very strongly to voters in the prosperous 1950s. And he easily won re-election in 1956, decimated his rival. But even in the first election in 1952, um, the Electoral College, when you look at the Electoral College map, um, Eisenhower won 442 of the Electoral College votes compared to Adelaide Stevenson, the Democrats, 89 point, uh, electoral votes. Um, Stevenson carried only a tier of the then solidly Democratic South. Uh, he won uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana. So that swath, as well as West Virginia and Kentucky and Delaware. And that was it. Eisenhower wins the rest of the United States, even places that were traditionally very Democratic up north, New York State, Massachusetts, all voted for Dwight Eisenhower. So that says a lot about his broad appeal uh, to the electorate. The Democrats will nominate the very same man in 1956, by the way, Adelaide Stevenson, and he will be beaten even worse <laughs> the next time around. Uh, the great losers in American political history. Uh, but Eisenhower brought a stability to America in the 50s, uh, paired with our spectacular economic prosperity. And remember, I told you last week that America was, after World War II, the only game in town in the free world. Uh, our European and, and Japanese competitors economically before World War II were all a mess after World War II, and not a single American factory was bombed in World War II. Uh, so we were ready to rock and roll. Uh, well, literally, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, after World War II, and America quickly became the world's dominant economy by far in the free world. In the 1950s, we produced the overwhelming majority of the world's automobiles, for example, um, in the 1950s. Now, uh, in your book, uh, sorry, um, one of the things that does transform as the economy starts to roar uh, the nature of American economic life begins to change. Now, America still makes things back then. Don't, don't get me wrong. We still had factories churning out product. But more and more, America was morphing into a service economy. It was, each passing year, slightly less important to work with your hands in a factory and more important to have the education to work in the office. So I don't know if you guys have yet learned the difference between a blue-collar worker and a white-collar worker. Uh, basically, blue-collar workers are people who work with their hands. Now, they do very important work, but they're essentially manual in their labor. 
So, you know, the, the guys who are out there building the cars on the factory floor, the, uh, the, the people who are uh, farmers and the like, you know, people who get out there and work manually to get things done, those are blue collar workers. White collar workers, well, they used to be called literally brain workers. Mostly what they do is think and shuffle paper and the like. Uh, white collar, uh, meaning, you know, the white man shirt with a necktie, you know, probably wearing a jacket kind of thing. The, the business suit, the white collar workers, that kind of thing. Uh, well, the, the, the change in the American economy after World War II was to greatly expand the percentage of the American workforce that was white collar. Um, more and more you have a managerial class. These factories got a bigger and bigger managerial class. And it came more and more about managing information uh, and providing intellectual services, thinking through things. Um, just to give you some stats, I've got a book here that just gives some stats. Uh, 1940, so the year before we enter World War I, in 1940, 44.9% of Americans were white-collar workers, these brain workers. That was just before World War II. That jumps up to 52.5% in 1950. A huge increase of 65.6% .6 in 1980. Uh, so, you know, the, the, every 20 years, we basically are adding 15% more of the economy is white-collar jobs. In 2000, that was 73%, and I'll bet it's even higher today. I don't have stats on that. But basically, three-quarters of us now have white-collar jobs, and more than that. I'm sure it's more like 80% or more uh, have white-collar jobs. We don't have people making things on factory floors so much in America anymore. That tends to be outsourced to other countries. We do services. We are teachers. We are managers. We are uh, you know, people who, who mostly write and produce documents and computer files and ship them around to each other to process. Um, so we have now a white collar economy. This is sometimes, by the way, called a post-industrial economy. And you could argue that it's in the 1950s that the real pivot starts and the 1960s and 70s complete that pivot from an industrial America to a post-industrial America. Um, what, made, what things made this possible? Well, partly uh, it was the result. Remember I told you about the GI Bill. After World War II, um, the government made it extremely easy uh, for men who had served in the military, then mostly men, um, to go to further their educations. Our colleges and universities began to mushroom in attendance. Uh, and so you have more and more people with these Educations that suited them more for management and shuffling information than working with their hands. Uh, so the GI Bill helped to change that. Um, but also, as America dominated the world economy, we remade the world economy. Increasingly, America favored free trade, meaning no more tariff barriers between nations in the 1940s and 50s, we were the great manufacturers still, so we still manufactured things and wanted to sell them to the world. But increasingly, as the rest of the world got back on its feet and started making things itself, more and more Americans started buying stuff from overseas. By the 60s, you know, Americans are buying things made in Taiwan, made in Germany even, uh, and less and less percentage of things made in America. So more and more, we became managerial types and uh, service industry types, and less and less the people actually made the stuff. We bought it from other countries, and that trend has more and more uh, become more and more dramatic in more recent decades. Another reason, the rise of the computer. The, v the very first very crude computers were built at the end of World War II. Now, they are so primitive by today's standards, you might laugh. Univac was a computer, I believe, 1947, just after World War II. It had the computing power of, you know, like a 70s-era personal computer, and it literally filled an entire building with its giant vacuum tube-driven uh, computer, but it could compute immense amounts of mathematical material, and it could store material, or you could store with it and read material on these punch cards, and that was a revolution. Over the 50s, more and more, they got more efficient, smaller computers, more efficient computers. In part, again, 1947, the development of the transistor, 
would shrink a lot of electronic equipment down very much. The very end of the 1950s would see the birth of the silicon chip. Actually, a couple of engineers at Texas Instruments in North Dallas are the ones who actually came up with a silicon chip. And you all know how that changed computing. So, you know, the technology of the computer from the late 40s through the mid 60s totally revolutionized. It became much smaller, much more powerful, um, and more and more began to dominate business. By the 60s, every corporation has computers churning out data, processing data, which again is going to foster the white collar workforce developments. America leads the way. Um, you know, this class is not just American history. What happens here in the 50s happens all over the world in the 60s, <laughs> at least in the industrialized countries. So the whole world just follows America down this path by the 1980s um, all over the world. The same kind of things are happening. Um, another change, the role of women in society. Now, remember I told you during World War II, American women went into the factories to take the jobs of the men who were in the military, right? Rosie the Riveter. Uh, but at the end of the war, Rosie largely quit, or in some cases were laid off so men could have those jobs back when they demobilized from the military. But a great many American women voluntarily left the workforce because they still very much wanted to be wives and mothers. They wanted to be homemakers. They didn't want a full-time job or even a part-time job at first. Um, they, they wanted to raise their kids. Remember, we talked about the growth of the suburbs and so on. But... Not all American women were keen on that after a while. Uh, you increasingly have, um, you know, the isolation of the homemaker in her singly, single family home in the suburbs. Uh, you know, almost having to go out of her way to find uh, the PTA, things to join just to have human companionship. This, this was much talked about. By the late 50s, there is a old cottage industry of books. But... Increasingly, too, with this service economy, there are jobs being opened up for women. Now, they're not, there's no even a sense yet that there should be a kind of parity between men and women in the workforce. That is not yet even on the table in most people's agenda to think about by the mid-1950s. So these women are going into what were often called pink-collar jobs, teaching, nursing. Those had long been fields where women played a major role uh, secretarial pools, the typing pool and the business and all this. So there are certain jobs that women did flow into uh, where they were the overwhelming majority of the workers in those fields. Those jobs, though, were often not terribly well paid. Uh, so, you know, if you wanted a job, you probably were working hard for relatively low wages in certain very narrow areas. But still, the ideal and if you've ever seen Leave it to Beaver or Father Knows Best, you know, this ideal homemaker in the suburban home raising the kids and all this, uh, that was still very much the stereotypical role that most women were taught. They were raised up to believe that was their role in life, and, and men accepted that that was the norm. It was widespread. Then some of you actually wrote a paper on this, I think, or maybe you haven't yet. But in 1963, so just after the 50s are over, a woman named Betty Friedan would write a critique of America called the Feminine Mystique, where she would look at these assumptions about the proper roles of women in American life and, uh, you know, how challenging they were, the problems that were raised by trying to impose this on a modern post-industrial economy. Uh, where, where women may want to actually have a job, but they're shunted into these very narrow fields at fairly low pay. Uh, she raised all kinds of issues. It was a real conversation starter. And some people would date the modern feminist movement, or I guess called second wave feminism, to the publication of Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique in 1963. Um, I want to talk about consumer culture, but I realize I've been going on nearly 15 minutes now. So we'll save that for the next lecture. Thank you.